Good evening, folks. Time to start our Sunday evening worship service. Our first song this morning will be number 50. This evening, be number 50. Following the song, uh, Brother Josh will lead our minds in our opening prayer. Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today, leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see, every heart they can hear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have lifted our burdens. We thank you for the cross of which that work was effected. We thank you for that sacrifice that covers our sins. We thank you so much for the blood that was shed that causes us to draw near to you. Father, we pray now that as we endeavor to worship you, that we worship you in accordance with your will, in accordance with your word. Father, bless these disciples in this endeavor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
If you'd like to mark your psalm books, psalm invitation following the lesson this evening will be number 705. 705. Psalm before the lesson will be number 41. Number 41. By his wonderful grace, we shall look on his face, redeem my the Savior's love. Since we're saved by his grace, and in heaven a place has prepared for my soul some name. By grace we come to know the Lord. With one accord, by his marvelous grace, we inherit a place by the throne of his love divine. Not of words that we do, but by faith working through. The wonderful gift of God. He has given a plan on his great love for man. By his grace we're redeemed from sin. By grace we come to know the Lord. Oh, let us sing. One accord by his marvelous grace, we inherit a place by the throne of his love divine. As we run in the race, we keep growing in grace. A crown to receive some day, for his grace will abide if we turn on a sun. Love and mercy he will bestow. My grace we come to know the Lord. Oh, let us sing. By his marvelous grace, we inherit a place by the throne of his love divine. Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary is a song that they sang a lot where I'm from. I haven't heard that for a while up here. I was looking there. The author of that song, John Moore, he's a Scottish preacher. He's still living. So that song isn't too old. Uh, 1952 is when it was written. So it's become popular in the Lord's Church. That's a new song. <laughs> so... Uh, but a good one. He was the Scottish naval chaplain there in Scotland. And uh, one of the uh, fellows in the Navy were was in a hospital, the barracks hospital there, and was uh, <coughs> critically ill. And uh, John Moore went to see him, and he would carry tracts in his Bible and he had one that was based off of John Bunyan's story, The Pilgrim's Progress, and it had a picture of <clears throat> the uh, main protagonist in that story. If you've read it, I think a couple of you have read it. Uh, his name is Christian, and he carries a great burden on his back. And the picture was of Christian, and uh, 
he explained to him that his burden could be taken away. And uh, that's how that song came to be. Well, I thought I'd finish this morning's sermon this evening. So we'll give it a try. I'll keep what I had for Sunday evening for a couple weeks from now. But <clears throat> uh, we are, the title of this lesson is Waiting for His Coming. I forgot to mention that this morning. Waiting for His Coming. And the text was Malachi 3, 16 through 17. And we noticed, uh, or began by way of introduction, uh, we noticed that there were those pious ones who were, named, who were known as the Hasidim, uh, the righteous ones, but the ones that waited for the coming of the Messiah. And they uh, had a hope, and this hope was one that was waiting in preparation to welcome. All right, we looked at Simeon, and tonight we're going to look at Anna. Now, uh, Anna is found in Luke chapter 2 and verse 36. The Bible says that's Luke 2, 36. Luke 2, 36. I think sometimes I say those verses and I don't give you enough time to look them up. Uh, you don't always have to look them up. We are not uh, saying that you must, but uh, I think it helps if you read along. I'm reading from the King James Version. Verse 36 says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was of a great age. And had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers and night. Now, I was going to do the math on this. But uh, I didn't. I thought I'd ask you all. How old do you think she was? 91? Now, how do you come to that? So, uh, yeah, so she was four score in four years. That's 20, 40, 60, 80, and four years. Now, and she had been a widow for how long? So she was a widow, she was a widow for 84 years. So, not for the, now, and she had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. So we aren't told the age that she got married, right? That's why I didn't do the math. We're not sure how old she was. Now, I can tell you the average age would be 12 to 15. So, she gets married seven years after she is 12 to 15. So let's meet in the middle and say she was 20 when she got married. Does that make sense? So if she was 84, 84 plus 20 is what? Hundred and four? You you said it? Well, Tommy, if you said it, I think that's probably right then, right? Yeah. Well, I was gonna ask him what it meant to be a great of a great age. That's what it says of her. Yeah, 104. Do you remember what Dan said when he preached this, Laura? How old he said she was? Were you paying attention when he preached it? Do you remember Dan Kessinger? <laughs> I think he said 91. I think that's what he said. Oh, the commentators, and it must be right, right? <laughs> I want to tell you something. The commentators say a lot of things, but... Uh, I, I, I'm not a big fan of a commentator. I like a fried tater or uh, something like that, Laura. 
Yeah. Yeah. As Google. Well, I think they have a little more than that. I'm supposed to be preaching here, aren't I? I better. My point is this. My point's the same as Luke. She was of a great age. And we're talking about people who waited. So if she's anywhere between 90 and 100 and some years old, she's waited a long time, hasn't she? Especially in a day when uh, folks didn't live very long. I don't know. Women probably live longer. We know that that's a fact today. Women live longer. Uh, I'll be doing something really stupid. And Laura always says, uh, this is why women live longer right here. But uh, I sometimes do stupid things, believe it or not. But Anna, Bible says in verse 38, she came in that instant and gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for the redemption in Israel or in Jerusalem, excuse me. Anna, we said that Simeon means to hear or hearing. Anna's name uh, is or means gracious. That's not a good name for us. I have a, a, a niece, Laura's sister's daughter's name is Anna. Did you know that it meant gracious? She is a very gracious young girl too. Uh, Anna is gracious. She is someone who has come to a great age. She's about as ancient as they can get. And yet she remains gracious in the end of her life said that she had been waiting for a priest. She'd been waiting, in verse 38, for the redemption in Jerusalem. Anna was serving God with fasting and prayers night and day, living soberly and godly. That's what Titus 2 and verse 12 says of the saint, that we ought to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's how we wait for the redemption. Soberly, righteously, and godly. With much prayer. We must be humble. I read a story here, and I, I wrote it down for you. It's about Booker T. Washington. Does anybody know who Booker T. Washington was? Yes, he was. That's right. If he was more than that. He was a brilliant man, and uh, he, uh, he uh, told of this story. He was an educator, a, a, a black educator, and he was uh, quite an example. Shortly after he became the president of Tuskegee College, or what they call Tuskegee Institute, which is in uh, Alabama, I meant to ask Van, I talked to Van the other day, I wanted to ask him, I think he's only about 30 minutes away from Tuskegee Institute down there where he's at. He is in uh, Selma, yep, Selma, Alabama. Uh, of course, Selma is now famous for the civil rights uh, move. I asked him, I said, have you walked across the Pettus Bridge? Uh, when he first went down, he didn't know what the Pettus Bridge was. <laughs> but he, he knows now. Uh, but when Bush, B uh, Booker T. Washington was the president of Tuskegee, uh, he was walking down uh, town in uh, kind of an exclusive uh, section of the town, and uh, he was stopped by a very wealthy white woman. Uh, she didn't know who he was, and she asked if he'd like to earn a few, a few dollars uh, she told him, I have some wood that needs chopped. And he rolled up his sleeves and followed her home, chopped up the wood, and when he was finished, he carried the logs into her house and stacked them by her fireplace. And while he was doing that, a little girl recognized him, and she let her mother know who it was. So the next day, the woman went to see Washington at his office and began to apologize profusely. And this is what uh, Washington said to her. He said, it's perfectly all right, madam. 
Occasionally, I enjoy a little manual labor. Besides, it's always a delight to do something for a friend. She shook his hand and uh, warmly, and uh, she assured him that his meek and gracious attitude had endeared him and his work to her heart. Could you imagine such a thing? Now, I want you to think about... We have trouble relating to that because... We didn't live during that time in Alabama. And we're not black. He could have said a lot of things, couldn't he? He could have got mad. He could have said, what are you doing assuming that I need to chop wood for you? But he didn't. We do have a race problem in this country. I hate to even say this because I'm being recorded. By the way, I don't say much at home uh, if that phone is anywhere near me. <laughs> I'm turning into a conspiracy theorist. I, I think they're always listening. But we do have race problems in this country, there's no doubt. I do not see one shred of evidence of systematic racism. I don't know of one law that's racist, even though I hear that word all the time, or those words, that there is systematic racism, but there's racism that exists. And we as the church need to confront it any time we see it, see it rear its ugly head. The fact of the matter is, I think both sides need to stop focusing on color and race. I only know of one race, folks, and that's the human race. And Jesus died to save all of them. And Booker T. Washington understood that. He was a man of faith. I don't know necessarily what denomination he was part of. I should know that. But I know that he had integrity. And I think sometimes maybe one of the uh, things that we need to practice a little more is not focusing on what divides us so much when it comes to our neighbors. And by our example, show them Jesus and the truth of his gospel and let them know that the redemption of Jerusalem has come. I think of our brother, Marshall Keeble. He had to deal with racism constantly constantly he had to sleep in his car because hotels wouldn't let him have a bed you imagine that I know one instance where a brother owned the hotel said boy I sure wish I could give you a bed brother Keeble could you imagine that one time he was preaching maybe I told you all this story he was preaching one time and uh, one of the white brethren come up to him and said I don't even know why you're preaching you don't even have a soul. And we were never called to preach to your people. He said, is that true, brother? And you know how he answered it? He said, I may not be a person with a soul. Am I a creature? He said, I, I suppose you are. And he said, well, if I'm a creature, Jesus said, go and preach the gospel to who? To all creatures. And before that meeting was over, Keeble had baptized that white brother, by the way. Isn't that amazing? Waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And finally, Joseph of Arimathea. In Luke 23 and verse 51, the Bible says, And the same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself, what? Waited for the kingdom of God. Joseph means adding, A-D-D-I-N-G. I think that's interesting. Joseph was waiting for the kingdom of God, and Joseph was not one who was quick to attach himself to Jesus. As a matter of fact, he is not ready to tell them that he is a disciple Remember, 
Jesus was tried before the Sanhedrin. And there are at least two members who we know to be disciples who were part of that. And Jesus dies. After his death, Joseph of Arimathea is one of the men who gathers up his body. The Bible here says that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. And why does Joseph of Arimathea hesitate? It's interesting that his name means adding. You see, I think Joseph of Arimathea could be guilty of playing the odds. He was adding up the dots, if you will, to use his name as a play on words. And when Jesus died, it seemed like all hope was gone. Joseph of Arimathea felt that he was doing a kindness to his friend, Jesus. But you see, Joseph had not added up or factored in his place in prophecy. Have you ever wondered how Joseph of Arimathea must have felt after the resurrection and after he is a man who is in the church as a Christian, I imagine someone might have come up to him and said, have you figured it out yet? Have you added it up that David spoke of you? You were the rich man of whom owned the tomb that our Messiah would be buried in. How about that? Could you imagine that awareness? I think Joseph, of course, lived soberly, righteously, and godly, because anyone who is waiting for the kingdom is one who lives soberly, righteously, and godly. Titus 2 and verse 12. I gave you an illustration this morning from George Herbert Bush. He had to thinking, you know what, I don't want to leave out George W. I have mixed emotions about George W. During the time, I wasn't much of a fan. But as years have gone by, it's interesting how we look at presidents. As, the, as time goes by, we begin to look at them uh, a little, uh, in a little better light, don't we? But uh, I remember in 2003, uh, because the news was made such a big deal about it, uh, he was over in Iraq and was serving over 600 soldiers Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, that's a good thing. He did that because he knew it got lonely for him. And he said, I thought it was important to send that message that we care for him. And uh, one of the uh, ironic things was, is the visit was well received by these battle-worn soldiers. But when the news showed up at the president's house, they also found that his family was surprised. They were expecting him at the ranch. It's funny to me sometimes the things that we expect and the things that we get. I cannot tell you the times of my life where I thought I did not expect it to go this way. I look at my life and I don't think that I could have seen the blessings that I have in my life. I couldn't have expected them at all. I mean, Laura, I told you she is a very lucky girl. And uh, I'm sure that things have worked just the way she wanted them. Her Prince Charming is now in her life and it worked, uh, the plan came together. but. The way the Lord mixes up our life to get us where we need to be is unexpected sometimes, to say the least. Well, I told you I wasn't going to keep you too long tonight. I'm in the conclusion. This Greek word that we've been looking at for the hope of Israel is the same Greek word that's used here in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, the one that we've been reading from. And it has to do with hope. Archaeologists have dug up first century cemeteries in Greece 
and in Rome. And while they were there, they found many tombstones that bore this phrase on them, hope, but with the compound added, ek, or ante. All of these tombstones that they found had the word hope on them, but they were preceded with the word no. Can you imagine that? Finding a tombstone, not just one, but a number of them from the first century that had the words no hope. That's a scary thing. Imagine living your entire life with no hope. Imagine going to your death with no hope. Now, I have thought quite often, especially recently, I don't know how people do it. So many people are dying, and so many of them do not have a faith. And I don't know how they face death. I think that uh, we are given a picture of how they do it in the Bible when it talks about their conscience being seared. I mean, to face down death without faith, it's not easy, is it? And yet I see people do it all of the time. Constantly. Hope is an anchor of the soul. Hebrews 6 says in verse 19, both sure and steadfast and that's what we hold on to folks when you throw out an anchor you make sure it's connected don't you you make sure that you've got a hold of the connection that there's a good connection because if there's a good connection that anchor generally isn't going anywhere and more importantly the boat isn't going anywhere if the anchor is lodged into the foundation that it needs to be that is where the sure and the steadfast part comes in. Our faith needs to be strong, but our foundation needs to be stronger. And so tonight, as we've looked at Simeon and Anna and Joseph of Arimathea, can we say like them, can we rejoice like them that we have seen the hope of Israel? We want to encourage you as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation. Who will follow Jesus standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest fight, listening for his orders, ready to obey? Who will follow Jesus serving him today? Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? In life's busy ways, working for the Master, giving Him the praise. Earnest in His vineyard, honoring His laws. Equal to His counsel, watchful for His cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus when the tempter charms? Lead them for safety to the Savior's heart. Trusting in His mercy, trusting in His power. 
Sing a fresh renewal song, His grace he shall. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, hear him mine. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, hear him high. Who will follow Jesus in his work of love, leading others to him, lifting prayers above? Courage, faithful servant, in his word we see. On the side forever will the Savior be. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Hey, Do we have any in our audience this evening who have not yet had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper? Okay. Thank all of you guys for coming out and being with us this evening. Our midweek Bible study will be Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Um, following the singing of number 510, Brother Dale will have our announcements, and he's volunteered to do the closing prayer as well. <clears throat> number 510, I only have the first and the third verse on the slide. So, so that's only two verses, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the last song was four. <laughs> yep, first and third verse, guys, number 510. How sweet will be the welcome home when this short life is o'er, when pain and sorrow, grief and care shall trouble us no more. Welcome home, sweet welcome home, my home, sweet home. Welcome home, sweet welcome home, the Christians welcome home. If we are faithful, we shall gain a land of promise rest, where with the Savior we shall live and be forever blessed. Welcome home, sweet welcome home, my home, sweet home. Welcome home, sweet welcome home, the Christians welcome Glad you saved that yawn till we was done, Scott. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Josh. And you got to remind Laura every day, just like I do my wife. She is one lucky woman. One lucky woman. Yeah. <laughs> In between swings, I am one lucky man. <laughs> Uh, we have a few prayer requests this evening. Um, Rhonda Miller White, that's uh, Tom and Gail's cousin, has heart problems. Remember her in her prayers. Uh, Rachel Get Gray will be going in for cataract surgery on her right eye tomorrow at 915 in Winchester. And she goes back on Tuesday or 720 for a checkup of the same eye. So keep Rachel in your prayers. 
Linda Fleming, Sharon's sister, was admitted this morning to Frederick Memorial. Any updates? They've been testing her today. They, they what, ma'am? They've been giving her tests. Oh, she's testing today. Okay. All right. Uh, and Scott and Shirley will be traveling. They'll be going till July the 6th. They'll be at their camp in Moorfield. And due to that, Ruella will need a ride. Okay. Wednesday the 29th, Sunday July the 3rd, and Wednesday the 6th. Okay. I think we'll get you covered, Ruella. And it's Alice's ninth birthday today. So remember, we already sang happy birthday this morning, but you only have one birthday, huh, Alice? Okay. Any others? Yes, sir. Uh, we went to the uh, sing at Broad Top last night, and <clears throat> Brother Ed Howell, we talked to them, said to tell everybody hello. He's going, has to go in for some back surgery, and uh, he doesn't know the time yet, but uh, he's awake now. He's having a lot, a lot of difficulty with his back. Okay. And also, the we need to remember and give thanks and praise for the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. And if we haven't done that, we need to do that on a personal basis as well. As we've been waiting on this for 50 years. It's been a while. And we need to be thankful. We need to praise God for that decision. And we need to pray for those who are upset about it. Yeah. We really do. Yeah. Okay. I'll take care of next Sunday. Okay. You got her next Sunday? Oh, <laughs> gee whiz. I thought I was going to have me a date, Ruella. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We'll get Sunday you next one. We'll get her Sunday morning, Sunday. Okay. okay. All right. All right. And we want to remember Brother Ed Howe. And uh, like Scott said, this Roe versus Wade thing, that's, that's, a, that's a great thing. And uh, like I say, let's pray for those who are so upset about this that those people need help. All right, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and we praise you, Lord. We thank you again for this time we can come and gather and to worship you. And, and Father, we just thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that went to that cross. And Father God, we do thank you for this Roe versus Wade that will return abortion that uh, some more babies may live. And Father, we pray for those who are upset about this. We pray for their soul. And Father, we just lift up the names here listed that was listed and mentioned. I uh, want to continue to remember Rachel Gray, um, Linda, Linda Fleming, and Father, all the others that we mentioned. We just pray that you put your healing hand upon them, give us all comfort, return us again our next appointed time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I've got uh, the July schedule if anybody wants a copy of it i'll make you a copy yes
the same stuff. They, they got the big fight one time down there. They didn't, I mean, they didn't start it, but. See, this is like, my brother was better than my brother. Yeah. Yeah. They just shoot anything. Yeah. I mean, they can stop shooting down. They try. They try. They try. That's when the gun's really good. I have to say that I'm not against you. Oh, sure, sure. I just Oh, I know. Well, some people, you know, it's okay for them to say something. It's just not okay for us to say something. We just two tough players. That's all. That's all pretty tough. We are good shooters. I'm still stopping the ball. Oh, yeah. When I was in college, I could jump up and throw a pistol. You see, you're not going to have a pretty good Yeah. You was a good one, too. You was a good one. Yeah, but I couldn't shoot. So we went to Christian University and I think they